Hi, everybody. So today we're going to pick up where we left off last time um, with the OCHEM separation techniques. So where we left off, uh, what, do we, what we covered previously, we covered uh, column chromatography in general, um, as well as just chromatographic um, principles, the mobile phase and the stationary phase. How do you separate two things in chromatography by interaction with either preferentially with the mobile phase or preferentially with the stationary phase would be how you separate things using chromatography. So we covered column chromatography, which operates based on polarity. We covered thin layer chromatography. Um, we also covered HPLC, um, and we got started on ion exchange chromatography, which is where we will pick things up here now. Okay, so um, let's say that we had, so we'll do sort of a warm-up problem to refresh on ion exchange before we head over to gas chromatography. So let's say that we had two proteins, protein A and protein B. Protein A has a isoelectric point of four. Protein B has an isoelectric point of eight. If we were to run these two proteins uh, through a cation exchange column, through cation exchange column at a pH of six, which would elute first? That will give you a moment to work on that. So for starters, when we talk about a cation exchange column, now what is the charge of the column? Does that mean that the column is positively charged or does that mean the column is negatively charged? The column is negatively charged, good. So you can draw some little beads in here. And then we have our two proteins a and B, excuse me, our two proteins A and B. And let's say that, for instance, our, our beads were being balanced out by sodium plus counter ions. Then what's the next thing we need to know? Know the charge of our column. What do we not know yet? We gotta know the charges of our solutes, right? So with <clears throat> pH versus pi, remember that pH is a spectrum. Yeah, the charge of our protein is perfect. pH is a spectrum and pi is gonna be one constant or one point on the spectrum of pH for a given protein or a given molecule. What do we know about pH? When pH is low, H plus is high. H plus is in excess. When pH is high, H plus is low. So what is the charge of a molecule when the pH is less than its pi? What is the charge of a molecule when its pH is less than its pi? Positively charged. When pH is equal to the pi? Zero, neutral. And when pH is greater than the pi? Negative. So when pH is less than the pi, we have an abundance of H plus relative to that pi, and therefore the net charge on the molecule is positive. When pH is higher than the pi, we have a deficiency of H plus relative to the pi. We don't have enough positive charge to get to a neutral charge, and therefore we end up with a negative charge. So then if we 
use the PI of our first protein A, which is four, um, and our pH is six, right? Then we're over here and protein A will be negative. And you over PI and pH again, that always confuses me. Yeah, um, so PI, so here PI, the isoelectric point. So the isoelectric point for a given molecule is the pH at which its net charge is completely neutral. Now that doesn't mean that no groups in the molecule are protonated or deprotonated or are positive or negative. It just means that if you have, let's say like 10 groups that are, uh, can be charged, maybe five of them are positive and five of them are negative. So that you exactly cancel out all positives and negatives in the molecule. So then when we lower the pH relative to the PI, we are increasing the concentration of H plus. So more groups are gonna be protonated and therefore we'll end up with a positive charge. When we increase pH relative to the PI, now we're taking away protons from the solution. So not enough groups will be protonated and we'll start to see the protein get a negative. So did that description help? Awesome, yeah, my pleasure. So then our protein A with a PI of four is gonna be negative. And if we then change our protein to B, B had an isoelectric point of eight. So are we to the left or to the right with our pH? So our pH was six. So then our pH is now going to be over here. So if a solution has a pH of six and then we are less than the PI, then a protein B will be positively charged. So which protein is gonna like this column more and wanna stick with it? And which protein, yeah. Which protein is gonna like this column more and wanna stick with it? A or B? Protein B, because B is positive, then B is going to be able to go in and displace the sodium uh, ions. Protein A, not really gonna like this column a lot, right? Protein A being negative is not simply going to want to go through the column. It's not gonna stick around. So at the end of this column chromatography, we would have our B, stuck to the column. And in our solution, let's say we collect what came out of the column in some sort of collection flask, we would see our original sodium that was displaced, exchanged, right? Cation exchange, our sodium, and then our protein A who did not like the column because it had the same charge. So the answer to this would be protein A. Any questions here? Good, good. All right. So now we're gonna switch gears. And we'll, oh, yes, question in the chat. Is the relationship between PI and pH similar to the relationship between pKa and pH? I'm really glad you asked that. Oh, I'm not really glad I erased that. Let me just put that back really quick. So we have pH, PI, um, and then let's compare that to pH and pKa. So of course, in both cases, when pH is low, H plus is high. When pH is high, H plus is low. However, and then we said that when pH is less than the PI, you have an abundance of H plus, and so more groups will be protonated. Um, and you'll get a positive charge when pH is equal to the PI by definition, the, pro the molecule is neutral. When pH is greater than the PI, we have efficiency of H plus relative to that PI, we have a negatively charged net charge. So we have net charge. And then, so with pKa, it works a little bit differently. Um, when pH is less than the pKa, we would say that the group is protonated. 
When pH is greater than the pKa, we would say the group is deprotonated. And when the pH is equal to the pKa, we have a 50, 50 in terms of protonated and deprotonated. We can think about that via the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation. When pH is equal to the pKa, we know that the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation says log of base over acid. So when the pH is equal to the pKa, we would have, we could subtract the same value from both sides. And if they're equal, it'll cancel and we will get zero is equal to the log of A minus over HA. And when we want to undo a log, and if you just see log, remember it's log base what? You don't specify the base of a log, the default is 10. So then if we wanted to get rid of our log, we would raise both sides of the equation using a base of 10. We can cancel our log on the right side. And then what is, uh, what is 10 to the zero or what is anything to the zero power equal to one? So we then end up with one is equal to A minus over HA. And if we multiply both sides by HA, we get HA, and this is concentration, is equal to A minus. So that's why you would have a 50-50 of conjugate acid and conjugate base when pH is equal to the PI. So protonation and deprotonation for sure. Um, of course, this is gonna depend on what kind of group we're talking about. So um, I think that the, re the other reason that's a really good question is because we get a lot of questions on the MCAT about like net charge of peptides and stuff like that. Um, and there are two kinds of groups, of course, in proteins, acids and bases. And acids we know tend to be carboxylic acids. So let's say that we did this relationship for a carboxylic acid. Maybe the carboxylic acid has a pKa around four. When pH is less than the pKa, the group is always protonated. And so if we have a carboxylic acid, protonated will be COOH. When pH is greater than the pKa, we said deprotonated, there's not enough protons to, um, to protonate it. And what would be the charge of a deprotonated carboxylic acid? Negative, good. So we'd see COO minus. So then charge would be zero for a carboxylic acid that's protonated. So when the pH is more acidic than a carboxylic acid's pKa, we have a neutral charge. When the pH is greater than a carboxylic acid's pKa, Carboxylic acid is deprotonated with a negative charge. And then just for fun, uh, what, would be the, what would be the net charge when pH is equal to the pKa for this carboxylic acid? Ah, so it would be zero over here when the carboxylic acid is protonated. But remember, at the pKa, we have a 50-50 mixture. So we have a 50-50 mixture of conjugate acid, which is neutral, and conjugate base, which is negative. So the net charge at the pKa is negative a half, negative 0 0.5. Yes, exactly. It's a Zwitter ion. Uh, so it's not a Zwitter ion. It's a it's a it's a 50 50 mixture of conjugate acid and conjugate base. Um, a Zwitter ion would be when you of course you have both positive and negative on the same molecule at the same time. Mm -hmm. And then, so the opposite or or, or uh, kind of different for bases. So let's say that we had um, an amine base. Uh, what's the pKa of like an N terminus, for instance? Eleven. It's a little more basic. Um, Eleven would be more like the the, uh, the pKa of the side chain of lysine, um, which is like ten point five. Um, but so that that is a that is for sure an, an amine though. Um, an N terminus is around nine. Yeah. So we can say you know around ten or so. 
And then depending on whether we're talking about like a side chain of lysine, for instance, versus a, a, an end terminus itself. So of course, uh, if we have an amine base, when it is deprotonated, it's gonna look like RNH2. When it's deprotonated, it's gonna be actually neutral. When it's protonated, what charge will it have? A positive charge. And then when pH is equal to the pKa, we'd have an, uh, uh, an average charge of an average charge of positive a half. So that's how really the, the pH pKa, um, you could use a similar sort of diagram for organizing your information. Um, so that's how you, you could apply that to like pH and pKa as opposed to pH and pI. So very similar and slightly different. Somebody wants to take a picture, please try to get all the glare out of the way. Okay, I hide this. Okay, if you want, if you want to get a picture, go ahead and take a screenshot. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. Okay, cool. Um, so, did I answer your question? And any other questions on what we've talked about? Awesome. Yeah, I know the. I know our friends at home. <laughs> I mean, everybody's at home, but I know our friends that are watching this on YouTube are going to appreciate that. All right, so let's move on and start talking about affinity chromatography. So recall that with all types of chromatographies, we have a stationary phase and a mobile phase. If you, in the case of like the cation exchange column, we had the stationary phase, which had a negative charge. And so the, um, the negatively charged um, uh, solute was likely to just flow through the column, did not want to stick around. Um, and so that was the principle for ion exchange chromatography. The principle is based on charge attraction or repulsion of how things are separated. With affinity chromatography, with affinity chromatography, we have in the stationary phase, a molecule fixed to groups that has with affinity for a solute in the mixture. In the stationary phase of affinity chromatography, we have a molecule or a group fixed to, let's say the beads. And that group has affinity for a solute in the mixture. The mobile phase will be the mixture itself. And the mixture would contain solutes with different affinities for the column. So our separation principle is affinity. Any questions so far? All right, so that's the um, description of affinity chromatography. So let's go over a few types of affinity chromatography. <laughs> So we'll start with the most common type of affinity chromatography that you're likely to see on the MCAT. So let's say that we had 
nickel two plus attached to a column. And we had a protein that has a histidine residue. Which one has the H, this one there? So the nickel can have what type of interaction with histidine? Does anybody know? Thinking about intermolecular forces, bond types. This be one of dispersion forces, dipole-dipole forces, hydrogen bonding, ionic bonding. Would it be coordinate covalent bonding? Okay, so um, any questions about this coordination affinity chromatography? Anybody curious why it's so common? What does the last line say? Um, uh, very common with his tagged proteins. He's in drugs like chemo. Uh, why is it coordinate covalent? Um, <clears throat> so coordinate covalent is when we have a lone pair donor, Lewis base, lone pair acceptor, Lewis acid. So in this example, we have histidine has a couple of lone pairs on its nitrogens. It's able to donate to nickel and nickel is really happy to accept those electrons uh, because nickel has a plus two charge. Um, and the, the other thing about coordinate covalence, it does have a lone pair donor, lone pair acceptor, Lewis base, Lewis acid. Um, it's a temporary donation. So this is different from ionic because in ionic bonding, right? We have, um, we have like, a, like a sodium and a chloride and sodium really wants to give up an electron to chloride. So sodium is going to be like, here, um, here, take chloride, take this uh, electron. I'm going to become sodium plus. So I'm going to be isoelectronic with argon. And you are going to be wait, uh, neon. And then you're going to accept an electron and become Cl minus. So now I'm sodium plus, I'm isoelectronic with neon. You're Cl minus, you're isoelectronic with argon. So we both now have noble gas configurations. So that would be sort of a difference between coordinate covalent and ionic. Because now we have a sodium plus and a Cl minus, and the reason they want to stick together is just have opposite charges. Whereas with coordinate covalent, it's a temporary donation of two electrons, but when this interaction is broken, disrupted, that nitrogen, both nitrogens, they're going to take both of the electrons away. They're not going to donate anything to nickel. Such I was thinking about uh, the histidine had a positive charge, got distracted from lone pairs. Yes. Um, uh, one other thing, since we're since we just did pKa and pH. Uh, there's a question on one of the AMC full links that uh, tends to throw people for a loop because if you assume that histidine being a basic amino acid is positive at a, um, at a physiological pH, uh, then you actually get the question wrong. So let's talk about histidine really quickly. Histidine side chain has a pKa of six. So it's a lot less basic than lysine, which has a pKa of 10 to the half, 10.5 on a side chain, and arginine, which has a pK of 12.5 on its side chain. So if we apply our technique that we just covered of uh, pH versus uh, pKa, um, and we say that, okay, well, 
Um, we know that for a base, when a base is protonated, it gets a positive charge. When it's deprotonated, it has a neutral charge. If we take a pH of seven to eight are the most common range for these charge questions. We actually find that histidine has a neutral formal charge. And that would be true at a neutral pH of seven, at a physiological pH of 7.4. And then if for some reason they asked you about a pH of eight would be no different. Um, so I know you didn't really ask about this, but I, I, want, I love talking about that example because I um, want people to not get it wrong. <laughs> awesome. So takeaway is histidine is basic, but it is neutral at a, um, at a physiologically relevant pH. Whereas the other bases, lysine and arginine, of course, they, if their pKa is actually like 10.5 or 12.5, then of course they are going to be protonated at those pHs. And then, yeah, so hopefully that helps. All right, so, um, so that's nickel histidine. And Next type of affinity chromatography could be called, we could call it receptor ligand. So let's say that you had, let's say that you had a receptor um, and you were trying to purify out its ligand from a mixture. Well, receptors usually have a very specific affinity for their ligands. And so out of your solution, out of your mixture, the only thing that's likely to make a bond with the receptor would be the receptor's ligand. So for instance, if we had a, a muscarinic um, acetylcholine receptor, and we wanted to purify acetylcholine from a mixture of neurotransmitters. We could do that using, by fixing the receptor, the acetylcholine receptor to the beads of a column. And then the very specific relationship would make sure that acetylcholine is purified from the rest of the solution. We could do this the opposite way too. So like, let's say that we um, used E. coli to express a receptor that we wanted to study in the lab. And we wanted to purify out the receptor we could fix uh, we could fix the ligand to the column and then we could purify the receptor from the mixture as well so this could work both ways any questions on receptor ligand and then the third common type of affinity chromatography would be What do we think that is? What does that look like to you? An antibody. So, um, so this would be our antibody. And then we could purify very specifically the antigens out of a solution. And so, um, of course, just like the other one that we discussed, the, the, uh, the receptor ligand, this could also be the opposite. We could also fix the antigen to the column and purify the antibody out of a mixture. Um, and this is a very, very, very strong interaction. So you'd probably have to use a low concentration of salt or a high concentration of salt to displace the antigen. we want to use a low or a high concentration of salt to displace the antigen. Yeah, we would have to use a very high concentration of salt to, they call it, wash out the antigen from that column. Okay, so um, any questions on affinity chromatography? Uh, why? Yeah, so um, uh, antibodies and antigens, they make, by the way, do they make um, covalent bonds, antibodies with antigens, or are they non-covalent?
Are they covalent or non-covalent? They are non-covalent, yeah. They are very extreme. In fact, they're one of the most, uh, one of the strongest non-covalent interactions in nature, um, antibody-antigen interactions. And so because they have such a tight intermolecular force attraction between the antibody and the antigen, so they got really strong hydrogen bonds, they got really strong dipole-dipole forces, maybe ionic as well. Um, that's why we would need like really, really strong intermolecular forces present in the solution to disrupt those. So we could use uh, we could use things like we wanted a wash protocol. We could use something like urea, which is a denaturant, and that could help us denature the antibody, as well as uh, it it breaks hydrogen bonds. So it could break hydrogen bonds between the antibody and the antigen. We could use we could also use urea with a high sodium chloride concentration, and so the salt. What the salt does is um, the ion dipole interactions, ionic interactions, like salt bridges, um, they'll disrupt things like hydrogen bonding as well. So that's why we want to use a really high concentration of salt um, so we can disrupt the non covalent interactions between antibody and antigen. Other questions? Mm -hmm. All right, let's move on to gas chromatography. You may hear gas liquid chromatography as well. And it's abbreviated as GC. And that's a common abbreviation. So if you ever see GC without any explanation in a passage, they are talking about gas chromatography. So sort of the macro scale setup for gas chromatography, we would have a, a gas supply. And so if you were ever wondering, it's like in an OCHEM lab, what was the purpose of those really big, like usually like helium cylinders that's just sitting there in the middle of the lab? Um, that's what that's for. It's for gas chromatography. And so we have, we pump gas into this column. We have a injector. So we add a small amount of our sample to our GC machine. And inside our GC machine, there's a, um, a cylindrical tubing with lots and lots of surface area. And then we'll have some kind of detector. You may have collection, but usually not. And the detector is also linked to uh, typically a computer that has some kind of computer program where it spits the detector information into the computer program. So that's like sort of our macro scale um, look at GC. Um, let's see, did I cover everything that I was going to talk about with that? Um, now, I just use the, <laughs> I'm gonna use the term macro scale, micro scale another time. So GC is really for separation on a micro scale. You're not going to separate large amounts of solute. Like let's say you did a reaction and you wanna collect all of the, uh, the product that you're interested in from your reaction. Um, you wouldn't be able to use something like GC because it's really a micro scale separation technique. It's not really run for like separating out all of the product I, did, I got from a reaction um, from like byproducts. It's more so like, is my reaction done? Do I detect any uh, reactant? Do I detect any intermediate? Uh, so it's really for like checking to see if your reaction is done. So our stationary phase, Let's see, actually I wanna do this over here. Our stationary phase, we have the GC column, which is coated with a liquid.
in our mobile phase, we have our, our, our reaction mixture carried by gas. The separation principle is volatility. What is volatility? Uh, the stationary phase is the, the coil uh, and particularly the liquid coating of the coil. What is volatility? Evaporation, <laughs> ability to turn into gas, yeah. So in other words, vapor pressure. So vapor pressure is basically like he said, um, the ability to turn into gas. So if we have stronger intermolecular forces in a molecule, would they have a higher or lower boiling point than a different molecule? Higher in molecular forces would mean a higher boiling point. And so what would that mean for vapor pressure? If you have stronger in molecular forces, are you more likely to be a gas or less likely to be a gas? Less. And then if you are less likely to be a gas, are you going to exit the column sooner or later? Well, if you're less likely to be a gas, you're more likely to stick to the column than be carried by the gas carrier. And so you'd have a later elution time. Um, or like a, in, the, in the GC readout, the peak for that molecule would be later. So if we zoom in a little bit on what's happening here. We just look at a section of coil. So we have the coil itself. We have the nonpolar liquid coating. Oh, sorry, it doesn't have to be nonpolar. It just has to be liquid. And then we have the uh, gas such as helium. Uh, he, 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 uh, pumping through with some other solutes. So we're going to have a blue solute and a green solute. And if we zoom in again, uh, let's do this. And let's say that our green solute has the weaker and molecular forces. And our blue has the stronger and molecular forces. Then is the green going to spend more time with the column or more time with the gas phase? The green has weaker intermolecular forces. <laughs> it's gonna spend more time with the gas phase. What about our blue? If the blue has stronger intermolecular forces, is it more likely to be a gas or a liquid? A liquid. Okay. 
And so which one is going to have the later elution peak? The green or the blue? The later elution peak would be the blue. Perfect. All right, so that's GC. Any questions on GC? Cool, looks like covered it, uh, unless somebody's typing. So next we're gonna move on to distillations. Uh, what is the relationship between boiling point and vapor pressure? They are inverse. Because if you have stronger inland molecular forces, it's harder for you to boil. And therefore you're less, you're gonna have less vapor pressure because less of your substance is gonna be in the gas phase. So, awesome. All right, so distillations now. Distillations, we will have the stationary phase, which is the distillation tube. And we have the mobile phase, which is the solutes of the mixture. And how does distillation separate by? What is the separation principle for distillation? Boiling point, excellent. separates by boiling point. So we'll have two types of uh, distillations, simple and fractional. With a simple distillation, we'll have our sample, we'll have some kind of heating element, a fire emoji. We'll have our tube. And then we'll have a collection flask. So that would be a simple distillation setup. And so if you have a higher boiling point, would you be expected to come out sooner or later? Higher boiling point, you're gonna come out of the column uh, later. You're gonna come out of the distillation apparatus later. We could say higher IMFs equal later elution. So remember I was telling you that uh, with GC, uh, you wouldn't really use GC to separate on a macro scale. Distillations, you absolutely will. Distillations are one of the best ways to separate macro on a macro scale, um, particularly when you have two substances which, have, which are liquid around room temperature. Uh, simple distillation works best for greater than 25 degrees difference in boiling points. So in general, all higher IMS will loot later. Um, you mean like across all, like for distillations or like in general for like all like chromatographic techniques? Uh, with a couple exceptions, if you, let's say you have like TLC. So TLC, the stationary phase, which we covered in the last video, TLC, the stationary phase is a polar silica gel. And so, um, uh, you could also use reverse phase column, wait, yeah, wait, uh, normal phase column chromatography. Wait, yes, where the col column is, no, sorry, reverse phase column chromatography, also covered in the last video, where the column is polar. Um, and, so, and the non and the mobile phase is nonpolar, 
where if you have hot, higher intermolecular forces, you actually be spending more time with the columns, you'd actually elute later. So it does depend a little bit. Um, I think a lot of the ones that we've seen today, as well as like um, normal phase column chromatography, um, if you're more polar, wait, I may be getting my normal and reverse phase mixed up. Hold on one second. Normal phase column chromatography is when you have a non. Uh, let me bring up Google. <laughs> I wasn't, I, I totally forgot about uh, the phases today, apparently. Normal phase is a polar stationary nonpolar mobile. Um, reverse phase is a nonpolar stationary polar mobile. More often, they're going to tell you uh, about what is the solvent and what is the column. So you wouldn't have to rely on these definitions. Um, but yeah, if we had a, an, uh, if we had a reverse phase column, which has a polar mobile phase, if you have stronger intermolecular forces, you're actually going to prefer the mobile phase and come out sooner. So to answer your question, it depends. Yeah. And then <laughs> fractional distillation, it will work with greater than, I think we usually say two degrees um, difference in boiling point. And so fractional is a little different. It has a, has a longer column. And this column is typically filled with a bunch of stuff packed with glass beads or steel wool, for instance. You have a longer column, and the column is packed with um, some kind of substance. And what is uh, what's and the, what would be the purpose of packing this column with um, like some kind of like steel wool glass beads? What's the purpose of this? So remember, with fractional distillation, we want to separate substances who have closer boiling points. Make it take longer for the substance to boil. Essentially, yes. So the additional surface area the additional surface area of a column will provide a substrate for boiling and condensation to happen. So you'll have a substrate that will allow for more evaporation, condensation cycles. So as you get further away from the heating element, of course, it gets cooler as you go throughout. So then if you're substance A, who has a lower boiling point versus substance B, um, substance A, who has a lower boiling point, it's going to tend to evaporate more. Um, but it's going to, as it gets further away from the, the heating element, it's going to cool down. So it's going to go like two steps forward, one step back, two steps forward, one step back, two steps forward, one step back. Whereas substance B, which has a higher boiling point, um, maybe just even a slightly higher boiling point, is going to be doing slightly more condensation and slightly less evaporation than the other substance. And so as one substance is doing more evaporation, and the other one's doing a little more condensation. Over time, over many cycles of this, we're gonna get greater separation between the two compounds. And that's what allows for us to separate uh, compounds that have more similar boiling points with fractional versus simple. So any questions there?
Is there a type of distillation that requires adding pressure or something when the boiling point's really high? Yes, so. We think about a pressure versus temperature graph. I'm not going to go through the whole thing here, um, but when you have low temperature and high pressure, you have a solid. You have high temperature, low pressure, you have a gas. When you have in the middle, you're a liquid. And if we find one ATM, normal atmospheric pressure. We go across, we can find two points. The point at which if we continue to increase the temperature, solid will become liquid. And what would that temperature represent? Temperature be at solid becomes liquid. What is that temperature for the substance? Melting point. And then if we follow over here, we find the temperature at which if we keep increasing temperature, liquid would become gas. And what would that temperature be? Boiling point. So um, some of these setups will use a vacuum. And so if we use a vacuum, are we increasing or decreasing the pressure? Use a vacuum, we're increasing or decreasing the pressure. The vacuums are a sucking force, so they are going to decrease pressure. So vacuum decreases pressure. What happens if we decrease pressure? What happens to boiling point? Boiling point decreases too, yep. So that's the purpose, um, as you were alluding to, of using a vacuum. So it's not added pressure, but it's, it's removing pressure. If we remove pressure from the system, we're going to encourage boiling to happen at a lower temperature. And so if we have substances where the, uh, where the temperature, if we have substances where the boiling point is higher, um, then for instance, the boiling point of water, um, then we could, or, or the boiling point of accessible solvents, we can actually lower the boiling point uh, to like attainable temperatures in our lab setting where uh, maybe they're not going to evaporate before the solvent. Um, why? Uh, why is, as in, why does lowering the pressure um, lower the boiling point? Yeah, why does the boiling point lower? Yeah, so if you think about, because um, what is boiling, right? Boiling is when a molecule is able to like break free of solution and go fly around and be a gas, right? So if we think about pressure as being like a squeezing force, when we have higher pressure, we're squeezing molecules closer together. And so they're gonna have tighter intermolecular forces. It's gonna be harder for them to break free of the liquid. If we lower pressure, we're like squeezing the solution less, squeezing the molecules less together and so it's easier for them to break up free and become gases. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Of course. All right. So, so that would be vacuum distillation, or that would be the purpose of vacuum distillation. Other questions here? I think I saw another question. Does the increased surface area from the substance it's packed with, not from the greater length of the column, it's both. Yeah, so the increased surface area uh, by the packed material as well as the longer column are both going to lead to greater separation. Other questions here? Cool, cool. All right, let's talk about separation, uh, extractions. So extractions. is going to be separation based on solubility. We say like dissolves like. 
there's not really a stationary and mobile phase for extractions the way there is with a lot of these other separation techniques. Um, the most common uh, extraction you'll see is going to be liquid liquid. Liquid liquid extraction where we're using two polar in miscible solvents, which is typically one organic and one aqueous. Very common uh, with extraction. Is using acid base properties to move a substance from one phase to the other. Very, very common uh, will be us using acid and base properties to either eliminate or introduce a formal charge um, to move a, a substance between the aqueous and organic layers. Let's define our extraction system. So we'll use some kind of extraction funnel and we will put in a, oh, our mascot is here. He's walking on my notes. Excuse me, dude, I'm um, teaching right now. So if we have the organic phase is typically on top and the aqueous phase, excuse me, yeah. aqueous phase, no, do not jump on my shoulders, uh, one second. All right, now that the cat's fed, let's continue to define our solvents. So organic solvents are, they could vary. For organic solvents, you could have something like diethyl ether, you could have chlorinated methanes, CH2Cl2 or CHCl3. Um, you could have um, ethyl acetate. Ethyl acetate, which is an ester, and uh, so the thing about all these solvents are these polar or non-polar solvents in the organic phase. Polar or non-polar. Hmm. Well, ethyl acetate I'll show you looks like this. Diethyl ether looks like this. Dichloromethane looks like this. So are those guys polar or non-polar? Yeah, they're all polar, yeah. Um, and then in the aqueous phase, of course, we have water. Now, who's more polar? These polar organic solvents or water? Who's more polar? Water is, yeah. So um, one, one thing is that even though these organic solvents are more non-polar, they are still pretty dang polar. Um, so that's gonna be relevant for when we talk about separation into phases. So what kinds of compounds go in each phase? In the aqueous phase, we have small, very polar molecules, uh, hydrogen bonding, um, hydrogen bonding, where it's like, I think the rule is something like less than five carbons per hydrogen bond. So for instance, if you had a molecule like phenol, Actually, I have a phenol example in a second. Um, and then in the organic layer, we'll have things that are less polar or larger than polar. 
large polar, nonpolar. And then one of the main things that we'll use, as we said, to differentiate for, uh, for the water, for the aqueous phase, is particularly anything with a charge. Anything with a charge will love the aqueous phase. So charges especially. So let's go into an example now. And let's say we took the molecule uh, cyclohexanol, cycloheptanol, which has a boiling point of 182 degrees Celsius and a pKa of 16, because it has an alcohol. Alcohols have a pKa of around 15, 16. And then if we have phenol, phenol has a boiling point of also 182 degrees Celsius. Does anybody know the pKa of phenol? Is 10. You do want to know that. Um, you, you do want to know both these pKa's. You want to know the pKa of an alcohol is around 15, 16, and the pKa of a phenol is 10. So we're going to be able to separate these using, um, yeah, you do need to. Do you need to, uh, are you going to be able to do, separate these using uh, distillation? Nope, but the same boiling point. Um, so could we use that extraction? Are these guys going to go to the same phase or different phase? Will these guys go to the same phase or different phases in an extraction? Mm. As is, these both have one hydrogen bond and they have six carbons or seven carbons. So these guys are really, really similar in terms of their intermolecular forces. So as is, they are going to go into the same phase, which is going to be the organic phase. So even though they have hydrogen bonding, the fact that they have such large groups attached to the hydrogen bond is actually going to favor the organic layer. What could we take advantage of with these two molecules in order to promote one of them moving to a different phase? What can we take advantage of? That's a good guess. Um, we could use, for, for resonance or for the aromaticity, we could use a column that has aromatic groups and do affinity chromatography based on pi stacking. Um, but for extractions, we can use the pKa's, yeah. So which one of these uh, would react with a weaker base than the other? The phenol or the alcohol? Which one will react with a weaker base? The phenol or the cycloheptanol? Let's see, is uh, higher or lower? So higher or lower pKa means more acidic. Higher or lower pKa, lower pKa is more acidic. So the phenol with the 10 pKa is gonna be more acidic. So if we use a strong, like a super strong base or concentrated strong base, we could react with both. But if we want to react with just one, we could use either a weaker base or a more dilute strong base. And so if we were to use, if we were to apply 5% sodium hydroxide, so not a super concentrated sodium hydroxide. Uh, yes, exactly, the lower pKa the phenol. We use a weaker, or so we could use a less dilute, or oh my gosh, a less concentrated, um, a strong base in order to preferentially deprotonate our phenol. And what charge is our phenol going to get when deprotonated? You need a negative charge. 
And is that going to favor it moving to the organic or the aqueous phase? The aqueous phase. Sorry for the weird notation of the cycloheptanol. The parentheses five means that there's five CH2 groups. It's just hard for me to draw a heptagon. <laughs> okay. So any questions on that? Ready for a more complicated um, extraction problem? Any questions before I erase the whiteboard? Yeah, um, to, to prevent the base from reacting with both, we use a more dilute base, a more dilute strong base, or we could use like a more concentrated weak base. But if we use it a concentrated strong base, we could actually move both to the aqueous layer. But if we're trying to separate them, that's probably not what we want to do, right? Cool. Any other questions? Okay, let's go ahead and do an extraction problem with four molecules now. So let's say we had Phenol, which has pKa of 10 and this guy with the nitrile and then this amine. And then this guy. What's the approximate pH of this carboxylic acid? I'm sorry, pKa. Ah, so the pKa of like two to three. Um, would be carboxylic acids that are part of an amino acid. So carboxylic acids in an amino acid. Are going to be around two to 2.5. And why are, and, and so a normal, like a basic carboxylic acid, uh, by basic, I mean like a, a, a one that's not in an amino acid, not a, yeah, you got me, um, has a pKa closer to like 4.8. Why does the carboxylic acid of an amino acid have such a more acidic pKa? Oh, the nine is for the N terminus. Why does this carboxylic acid have such a more acidic pKa than that one? Proximity to the amine, perfect, yeah. So C-terminal C -terminal carboxylic acids, as well as the side chains of aspartate and glutamate, um, which are about like um, three to four for the pKa. Um, they're more acidic than your normal carboxylic acid because of the proximity to the amine, which provides inductive withdrawing of the negative charge, which is going to help stabilize the negative charge. Make sense? Yeah. No problem. So the, yeah, so your normal carboxylic acid is going to be around four to five. And so, um, and then we're going to use notations O for organic, A for aqueous. Okay, so what would be the first step in our separation? Which of these is unlike the others? 
that we can separate first? And what will be used to do that? The third one, the amine. So the amine is unlike the others because the amine has what property? It is a. base. So if we wanted to move a base from these will all start in the organic layer just because they have a lot of they have a lot of uh, a lot of carbons they're pretty big. Um, if we wanted to move the amine into the aqueous layer, well, what would we use to treat it with? Acid. Right? So if we applied 10%, don't worry about these percentages, y'all. Um, they should not necessarily mean anything to you. So if we treated it with 10% HCl, we would protonate the nitrogen, and this guy would move to which phase? the aqueous phase. And we'd be left with everybody else in the organic. I'm not going to redraw them. So what would be our next step? for separating the remaining three. Good enough. What would be our next step to separate the remaining three? Which one do we want to separate next? Add some base. And um, which molecule is, uh, do we want to use a, do we start with a weaker base or a stronger base? I'm going to start with a weaker base. And which molecule is that going to preferentially react with? First, second, or fourth? Fourth, perfect. So if we use something like 10% sodium bicarbonate, is bicarbonate a strong or a weak base? Bicarbonate is a weak base. So if you use a weak base like sodium bicarbonate, we can move, we can preferentially react with our more acidic carboxylic acid while not reacting with our less acidic phenol. So the weaker base can react with the stronger acid. And then Oh God, that was terrible. <laughs> There's a minus charge, that's the important part. And that guy has now been moved to the aqueous phase. Use those, I'm gonna just, it's bothering me a lot. Okay. And now we're down to two. And we'll just say, we're done with that. And now we're between molecules one and two. They left in the organic phase. And what we want to use now? Who do we want to separate out next? Molecule one or molecule two? And what do we use? So we have, a, we have a nitrile, which really doesn't have any acidic or basic properties. We have a phenol, who has weakly acidic properties. So we want to use a strong base next. So we could use something like 
potassium hydroxide. And then who's going to be left in the organic phase and who's going to be in our aqueous phase. A uh, person who DM'd me. Um, the purpose is to move them to the aqueous phase. Uh, yes. So typically with, with this separation technique, we have a lot of molecules that are, with organic molecules, they tend to be pretty large. Um, and so more often than not, we're taking advantage of like one or two functional groups on the molecule uh, that are acidic or basic in order to turn them into a charged functional group, which will make them go into the aqueous layer. Um, so yeah, so this separation technique deals with pretty large um, organic molecules that are typically all gonna be in the organic phase unless acted on by an acid or a base converted into a charged molecule, which will then send them to the aqueous phase. And if like in this case, we're doing an, ex this is an extraction scheme. Um, so we were given like four molecules and this is not uncommon in an OCHEM reaction where you may have several byproducts. Um, so yeah, typically with, with, these, um, with these extractions, you're, you're moving some, one molecule at a time into the aqueous phase, getting like uh, rinsing out the aqueous phase, putting in more water um, and then repeating for the next molecule. Of course, the MCAT could show you examples where, you know, two molecules start off in the aqueous phase and then you need to like turn them into uncharged molecules. So our goal is to identify the molecule in the organic phase. Uh, yeah, the type of problem on the MCAT is gonna vary. Um, the problem definitely could be like, okay, which molecule is going to end up in the aqueous phase and which one's going to end up in the, in the organic phase? Or they could be like, okay, here's a reaction that was done. And so there's these two molecule products. We're interested in one product and not the other. And then maybe there's one byproduct as well. What is the best extraction uh, protocol to separate out the one product of interest from the product we don't care about and the byproduct we also don't care about? So um, yeah, a few different ways that they could ask this. <laughs> Great question. So then we'll be left with our, uh, I'm, so, I'm just gonna write nitrile and then Our phenolate. All right. So here's the trying to get rid of the glare. Here's the full extraction scheme. Um, any questions on this problem? Any questions on extractions in general? Um, we have one more. Uh, separation technique to cover. All right. So our last separation technique will be for enantiomers. Anybody remember the name of the separation technique that's used to separate enantiomers? A uh, uh, person who DM'd me, generally wondering when would you use a strong versus a weak acid. Um, so if you had two bases and like one base was stronger than the other base, then you would start with a weaker acid. So you could react to the stronger base, turn it positive, and then move it into the aqueous phase. Um, and then you could use a, a stronger acid to then move the weaker base into the aqueous phase after you've already removed the first base. Likewise with bases and, and acid molecules. If you have two acids, like we did, when one's, one's a stronger acid, you start with a weaker base, so you can move the stronger acid and give it a negative charge, move it to the aqueous layer, and then um, use a stronger acid base, stronger base to then move the weaker acid. Yeah, the opposites are react first. Yeah, so the takeaway is if you have like a stronger and a weaker acid and base, you are going to separate out the stronger one first with a weaker, whatever the opposite is. So why do we need a special technique for separating enantiomers?
why do we need a special technique for separating an antiverse? Why can't we just use any of the techniques we've already covered? Why would they not work on an antiverse? Same properties, the same chemical and physical properties, right? What's the one property that differs for antimers? Rotation of plane polarized light, excellent, yep. So the problem with an antimers is an antimers, an antiomers have identical chemical physical properties. So none of our other techniques alone unless we do certain modifications, will work to separate an antimers. Um, so that's the problem. And that's why I like to, or that, that's how I like to remember it's called resolution. Because we, when it, with an antimers, with separating antimers, we have a problem, that they are too similar to each other. Um, and how do we fix the problem? We resolve the problem by using resolutions. So that's how I remember resolution is for separating an antimers. So a few different ways that you could use to separate an antimers. There's crystallization. So sometimes when you crystallize, um, they will form an enantiomerically pure crystal. Doesn't always work. Now there's one technique that we covered today, which if we use it in a certain way, we can separate out an antimers. So which technique that we covered today, if we modified it, could we use to separate an antimers? So would ion exchange chromatography work? Oh, already, affinity, good. So affinity chromatography. Let's talk about how we could use affinity chromatography to separate the mixture of an antimers. If we use a chiral column, and we fix a molecule that has affinity for only one enantiomer, that we could use a chiral column, we could use an affinity column um, to separate out that enantiomer. That enantiomer will stay with the stationary phase. Nice. Is that making sense so far? Any questions on the first two techniques for resolution? Cool, cool. So, because um, the third one is gonna take a little more space. All right, so. Those are our first two. Chiral column is going to be more reliable for sure. Um, particularly, like we could use things like receptors. So maybe there is a receptor which, like, only one of the enantiomers is like physiologically relevant or, or relevant to cells. So maybe the cells have a, a receptor which only has affinity for one of the enantiomers. Um, that would be sort of the main. That would be the main one. Okay, and then the third technique for resolution of enantiomers is called diastereomic salt formation. Diastereomic salt formation. So how this works is we apply a chiral molecule to append the enantiomers an 
and turn them into diastereomers. Because do diastereomers have identical chemical and physical properties the way enantiomers do? No, they do not. And then with diastereomers, we can use other separation techniques such as distillation or gas chromatography uh, or um, maybe even, yeah, I feel like distillation would be my go-to for that. I'm just assuming they hopefully have different boiling points. All right, so let's do an example. Um, this is from a paper that I found when I wrote this lecture originally. So if we take um, a, uh, a racemic mixture, racemic at this carbon, we take a racemic mixture of this, this compound. So the enantiomers differ at only one stereocenter because there is only one stereocenter. AR represents an aromatic group and we apply Oh my gosh. I really didn't choose an easy molecule to draw. So if we take these two guys and react them, um, so how is the reaction going to go? Who's going to serve as a nucleophile? Who's going to serve as the electrophile? The OH is a nucleophile, perfect. So here's going to be our nucleophile, and where's the electrophile? Carbonyl, excellent. So we can have this guy come in and react with the carbonyl carbon, because the carbonyl carbon will be partially positive, and this will be partially negative. And we can break the pi bond. And we haven't done reactions together yet. And then the pi bond is going to come back down and kick off the chlorine group. And now what we're going to have is one of our enantiomers and then our other guy we'll end up with these two guys and what's the relationship between these two molecules how many stereocenters do they have? How many stereocenters can we count? Two. So we have the one right here. This is not a stereocenter. This is not a stereocenter. This is not a stereocenter, but this in the middle here is. So we now have two stereocenters in our molecule. And because we've reacted both enantiomers from the original molecule with the same group, this stereocenter will be the same, the one that we added. And then the original stereocenter that was the problem, 
with these enantiomers will be different, and we have created diastereomers. which may have something like a different boiling point, and then we could use like fractional distillation. So any questions on diastereomic salt formation? Uh, which one would have the bigger boiling point of these two? Uh, for us, it's impossible to tell because all of the um, all the functional groups are the same. There's just some like different orientation relationships. Um, it's impossible for us as humans to look at these molecules and know. Mm -hmm. Other questions. So that is our last separation technique for the day. So we are done with OCAM separations. The orientation um, would change the boiling point, just not in a predictable way. Yeah. Diastereomers we know would have different chemical and physical properties. Yeah. So for instance, boiling point could be a different physical property, melting point. Um, I don't know about polarity, probably be very similar. Any last minute questions while we're still recording? So um, that anybody who's watching this on YouTube uh, would benefit from your questions. Remind us of the PK of histidine is. The side chain of histidine, uh, the PK is six. Like 6.04, so it's six is for us. All right, well, if you are watching this on YouTube, thank you so much for your attention. Feel free to subscribe to my page. We'll be coming out with more OCHEM videos um, in the future. And thank you for everybody who attended. And I will see you later. <laughs>